uh, and uh, and now I'm still volunteering and helping in any way I can, filling air bottles or EMT classes or whatever. Uh, a little bit about myself, I uh, practiced obstetrics for 38 years in Spokane. Uh, I retired technically three years ago. The last three years, uh, 2007 to 10, um, I helped start the perinatal center at Sacred Heart, the high-risk OB center. It was one of the first, I was the first OB hospitalist in town, I don't know if you know what that is, but yeah, we just did high-risk OB. So I've done probably seven or 8,000 deliveries. The last three years just doing high-risk OB, so any question you have, please ask. And specifically, we're talking about uh, obstetrics today, but I'm more than happy to talk about hormones, GYN issues, or anything else uh, uh, the men may want to be asked about, or the women want to ask about. Uh, I've, I'm retired, so I can stay as long as you want me to afterward uh, to speak, of, ask questions about anything. And no question is stupid, so interrupt me any time. I can assure you, if you ask the question, half of you probably are asking the same question, they just don't want to ask. So um, we'll go ahead and start. But basically, this is going to be a, a refresher for all of you on uh, obstetrical and gynecologic. And I'm hoping this goes. Uh, I anticipate this taking about an hour and a half, two hours, depending on how fast I go. Uh, I can go real fast, I can go slow, and I can stick around and ask questions and go in more detail on any one of these slides, so don't hesitate to say, uh, how about talking three more minutes on that slide. We're going to go over the uh, basic anatomy, which a lot of you already know. I don't have a pointer. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a, I would have dressed a little bit differently, but I've had two granddaughters in the last two months. Uh, my son delivered, his wife delivered in Iowa City eight weeks ago, about now, and uh, my daughter delivered two weeks ago, and they both called me. My daughter sent a picture of uh, uh, Annalise, my first granddaughter. I've got two grandsons, so I've got four grandkids. And she had just uh, had a bob movement over their brand new couch. And uh, she said, this is what the parenting's about. And my son said, that's all babies do is poop and pee. And I wrote in, how about the urination and bowel movements? And they, my son called me as I was walking here, Dad, you're, this is not medical, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, the anatomy of the uh, uterus and stuff like this is, this is the uh, uh, uterus, if you will. The amniotic sac is what the baby floats in, uh, and the umbilical cord attaches to the, uh, the placenta, attaches and grows into the wall of the uterus. And there's a, you know, maybe a half to a centimeter, half centimeter, uh, where it grows in and gets the blood supply to the placenta which goes to the baby. Uh, the uterus here, this is what they call a fundal placenta. Placenta can be anterior, it can be posterior, it can be a placenta previa, when the, or a partial previa. And if I'm using terms someone doesn't understand, please say what's a previa. I'm assuming something, but anyway, so the, uh, here is the uh, uh, vagina, the cervix. Uh, this is the bladder right here and the rectum right back here. And it's a pretty close area between the two and the pubic bone right here. And this is obviously a vertex presentation with the fundal placenta and that's the sort of the terminology you will hear but you're not going to know that when you're on a call. Um, but that's sort of a basic outline and you can have, we're going to show other pictures, uh, this is a vertex presentation, you can have a breach with the butt coming down first, you can have a compound with a foot and a hand, you can have a, a hand sticking down, you can have a prolapsed cord as the cervix dilates up, the cord, instead of being up here, if it's an anterior or a posterior uh, placenta, lots of times the cord will slip out, which we're going to go into in a little bit. Questions on the anatomy? Okay. Three stages of, uh, of pregnancy, of labor and delivery, I should say. The first stage is when the woman uh, comes to the hospital and starts dilates, is dilating from a closed cervix. Uh, to 10 centimeters. So that's the first stage. Second, and that stage can go for, as you women can know, technically it only goes for 12 to 24 hours. But my wife swears she was in labor for three days. She really wasn't in labor for three days, but she was having irritability. But the first stage is when they, from technically when they start dilating up. So for two or three days, my wife with two of our three kids 
was one centimeter for a while, then the second pregnancy was two centimeters. She swears she was in labor. She argued with me, and I lost the argument. But having said that, uh, technically uh, labor, the first stage is when they start opening up and are continuously dilating, or you can get a secondary arrest of dilatation and do a C-section because they fail to dilate despite a good labor pattern. Second stage uh, is from the time their uh, woman's complete dilatation, 10 centimeters, to the time they deliver. That can be minutes, it can be a couple hours, depending on every situation. But that's the second stage. Third stage is the baby is out, the placenta hasn't delivered. Uh, and that can go on for five minutes, it can go on for hours, or, uh, if need be, so um, if it happens. So there's different times for each one of these stages of labor. Uh, but technically on a call, you're not going to know that, but we'll go into that a little bit later. You're just going to know she's in labor or potentially in labor and go to the hospital, which we'll go into. Questions about first, second, third stage? Does that all make sense? Okay, what are you going to do when you re arrive on scene and the woman says, I'm in labor? What are the type of questions do you want to ask and document uh, on your record? Uh, first name, name, age, when's your due date? Most women today know their due date. They usually know how many weeks gestation they are, meaning doctor tells me I'm 20 weeks, 30 weeks. Pregnancy technically is 40 weeks. 40, after 40 weeks, it's called post dates, 40 to 42. Preterm labor is really uh, before 36, 37 weeks. From 38 to 40 is actually considered more term. So you're going to know when's your due date, and then you ask her if she knows by chance how many weeks she is. If she doesn't, you can pretty well. Do you have? Do you carry those little OB calendars with you by chance? No. Okay. It's not that critical, but they they're going to know seven months, eight months, but they usually know the weeks because we don't use months generally anymore. We always use weeks because the ultrasound is so good nowadays, and most of these ladies, a lot of them have had ultrasounds. Uh, is this your first delivery, second delivery? Are there twins? Any complications the doctors told you about? Yes or no? What are they? Uh, if there are none, when did the contractions start? When did your bag of raw water break? When did, did you have any bleeding? Um, how far apart are the contractions? Um, how long are they lasting? Minutes? Are they lasting 30 to 40 seconds? How long do they last, do you think? Lots of times they're not going to know. And that's why it's critical you're a team uh, with your partner in the ambulance. But you also have the fire, usually, uh, you have the fire department guys there from somewhere, or some extra pair of hands. So you can tell them to do the paperwork or whatever you work out, but I'd work it out ahead of time. You probably have this, I just don't know right now, but you're going to want someone to really do the paperwork. You may want someone putting a hand on the belly. And when I was interviewing uh, the last, well, well, I did it every time, but um, it's really critical what I'd like to do is sort of, as I'm asking the questions, I'm looking at my watch, or the watch on the wall, and I got my hand resting on her uterus. I'm just feeling if the baby's moving, if I can feel any motion. And I'm not, you know, you gotta be careful doing it, but you say I'm, I'm gonna rest my hand on your uterus to sort of feel the contractions. And then you can sort of get an idea and time it, uh, what the, uh, uh, how the contractions, how palpable they are. So just think, keep that in the back of your mind because lots of times they don't know or their partner didn't keep track. So if you can have uh, the two of you on the team sort of asking the questions, Maybe the fireman or whoever is with you, there's an extra hand writing down the dictation. Um, or if you've got different forms, you work it out. Uh, so you have the answer to these questions as they're doing. What kind of discharge did you have? Was it uh, clear fluid, like amniotic fluid, which is clear? Was there meconium, which we'll go into in a second. If a baby has a bowel movement in the uterus, it can be early uh, because of whatever reason whether we don't understand meconium totally so it can be old and green or dark green or green brown it sort of depends on when the, the older it is the greener it is and the thicker it is uh, the fresher it is the more brownish it is, brownish color it is brown green and I think brown is usually pretty fresh and within a few days uh, green is maybe a week or ten days yellow is weeks before so if the baby was under stress for whatever reason and had a little, and maybe just normal, honestly. <laughs> so, but it's something to be aware of because meconium aspiration, meaning during labor and delivery, if the baby swallows the meconium, uh, whether it's brown or yellow or green, it's not good because it, it's like a cement in the baby's lungs. And the doctor, 
should be aware of that. And when you call ahead and you're on your way to the hospital, you're going to say, ah, oh, yeah, she had a clear watery discharge or she had a thick brown or green or yellow or whatever. So the hospital is prepared. They should be prepared anyway, but they're going to be even more prepared if you tell them she had green meconium or whatever. Uh, bleeding, bright red bleeding, is to be expected. It can be light or heavy. As the cervix dilates up, the uh, cervix is about uh, uh, three centimeters long when it's closed and uh, two or three uh, two centimeters thick. And that's got to thin out to a like paper thin, uh, effacement they call it. So a zero effacement means the cervix is perfectly normal, thickness and size and length. And as it, faces, it effaces during labor, it goes from 10 percent, 30, 40, 50, 100 percent uh, effacement are like paper thin. And as that cervix is thinning out, it bleeds a little bit. Um, I tend to ask them also a question as they're walking to the hospital, did you had any intercourse? Or did you fall down? Or were there any trauma? Because uh, there is a myth out there uh, is that if you have intercourse, they'll push you to go into labor. So a lot of ladies will say, well, yeah, I'm tired of this and we had sex and that usually causes bleeding. So, but, but he asked that question so it makes you stay aware. And you've got to ask, uh, they're not going to know if the baby's crowning. Someone's got to take a quick little look and see. You cover the lady up, do it respectfully, and see if you make sure you don't see something coming out. Uh, you don't let them go to the bathroom because the last thing you want to do, oh, I've got to go to the bathroom. No, forget that because uh, I can't even tell you in the hospital. They will sneak out and go to the, think they had a bowel movement or something, they have a baby in the toilet. Doesn't happen as much anymore, but it still happens. When, not when the nurses are there, but when they sort of sneak out and do that. Uh, any other questions you think we ought to ask? Or is that you ask uh, when you go to a possible labor and, and possible woman in pregnant is considered labor. You can go into labor, preterm labor at 20, 22, 24 weeks, and they always get transported down to Sacred Heart Deaconess now because that's where the intensive care nursery is. So you've got to suspect labor uh, after 18, 20 weeks, or even 16, 20, you didn't have preterm labor. So there, you always suspect labor. Before 12, 14 weeks, you suspect ectopic pregnancy with belly pain. And there's, we'll go into that too. I'm just sort of throwing that out. Uh, but any other questions that you can think of asking uh, when you arrive on scene? And you get the vital signs. Don't you normally ask them if they've had any complications with their pregnancy? Wouldn't that be the time to... Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm, good question, and it's true. I, I thought I mentioned that, and I apologize if I didn't. Uh, yeah, that's one of the first things you're going to ask is name, age, due, first delivery, second, third, twins. Is it in vitro? I mean, you can just, that's a little more technical, but in vitro has a little bit higher complication rate for reasons we don't understand. But just so that's uh, full history. And uh, ask any did it obstet obstetrician, do you have any problems? Have you had trouble with high blood pressure? My daughter uh, had a C-section and um, two weeks ago for a pregnancy-induced hypertension. Started about, she got a section at 39 weeks and she started about 35 weeks. Uh, it wasn't toxemia or preeclampsia, but it was just preg what they call pregnancy-induced hypertension. And she called me, bad, bad, you know. So anyway, I got twi two phone calls after every doctor's visit. This is what the doctor told me, what do you think? So, um, and she ended up getting induced at 39 weeks and uh, it was a failed induction because the baby was what they call asynclitic, meaning the baby's head was kicked off to the side. You have seven cardinal motions as the baby's is saying the pose, and she got stuck somewhere in the middle there and had a C-section. Baby's fine, she's fine. Um, but that would be an example of a complication. Would the doctor say, if you had trouble? Yeah, I've had some hypertension. So she may not know what that means, but you do. Or I've had proteinuria. Or I've had a lot of bleeding in the second or third trimester. Anything, if you had any problems at all that the doctor was worried about. So, but, so that's the first thing. And that's when you're asking the questions, it's nice to have a partner to be writing this stuff down so you don't have to ask the question, write it down, ask the question. Usually by the fifth or sixth question, I forgot what I asked first. So, good, good point. Thanks for bringing that up. What number of babies as far as twins or? twins or triplets? Or oh, yeah. There's no qu twins and triplets, uh, quads with in vitro nowadays. Uh, yeah, anytime you have more than one gestation or one baby inside there, it's a higher complication rate. Absolutely. And we can go and we spend a lot of time on that, on twins, triplets, quads, and they're all got different levels, but they all have preterm labor. They all have big placentas. They all have bleeding troubles. They all have uh, 
a uh, higher rate of pregnancy-induced hypertension. Uh, they all, uh, not all of them, but you start watching that earlier. And the more babies you have, the earlier it starts. So that's why he goes back to the first question, have there been any problems? So thank you for bringing that up. Any other questions you think we, uh, you can think about that you've asked or you've heard someone ask? Are there also just high-risk moms? Like, isn't diabetes sometimes make the mom more Oh, risky? absolutely. Um, so you can uh, ask her for health issues too. Yeah, well, yeah, this is not, uh, when I say first delivery, when I said problems, if you had any problem with the pregnancy, you can have uh, hypertension, you can have diabetes, you can have uh, blood dyscrasias, you can have uh, thyroid problems. That goes back to the original question. I didn't want to go into the whole differential, but what have you been told is high risk here? Are you taking, if you're now, if you have diabetes, then you want to know, are you taking insulin? Or are you on oral medication? What, what kind of testing has the baby the doctor's done? Because if you have diabetes or thyroid trouble, the, the doctor is generally going to be start testing the baby earlier. I just wondered what the more, most common ones were, because I think oh. diabetes was. Because we have patients, you know, we don't have as many ones as, as they do because we're out in hope, but we've had patients where we ask them if they have high blood pressure, and they said, oh, no. And then you pull out their medications, and, and they yeah. say, well, yeah, because I take a medication for that, so I don't have high blood pressure anymore. <laughs> yeah, so, so you have well, to be really uh, clear about what you ask them. <laughs> uh, excellent point. Thank you for that. And that, that goes to being clear. Uh, they don't know lots of times. Yeah. And, uh, and if you're taking any medicines, I didn't include that. That's thank you for bringing that. Are you taking any medicines, vitamins and iron? Are you taking uh, oral hypoglycemic? Are you taking a hypertensive? Are you taking thyroid medication? What kind of medications are you taking? And that's right in the first. So when you're asking that, so I think uh, medical problems, are you taking any medications? Has the doctor done any testing on you or the baby? above that because we check a diabetes usually at 18 and again at 28, 30 weeks. Um, and if they get treated, no, no, I'm, I'm on diet. Yeah. So that's a good point, so thank you. Other questions you think we should ask or you've heard asked? Good comments, thank you. Okay, this next slide. Frequency and duration of contractions. Um, we're going to go into abruptions and previous in another slide, but uh, you want to know how far apart are the contractions, and that goes back to, I just sort of, as I'm asking the questions, I literally just sort of holding on to, and just feeling the contractions. A lot of times you can't feel anything. If she's really a little uh, fluffy, you might not feel anything. But the, um, but at least you can feel them. Whatever, okay. I'm trying to be politically correct. But anyway, the, uh, <laughs> you, you just might not feel anything, but I think if you rest your hand on, if they have a real titanic uterus or an abruption going on or a partial abruption going on, the uterus is going to be hard, and that might actually hurt her by putting your hand on. It shouldn't hurt to have your hand on the belly and sort of just sort of push in a little bit uh, once in a while to see if you can feel the contractions. Uh, so if they do, uh, ask that. Uh, again, we talked about if you feel the urge to push, uh, check them before, don't let them go to the bathroom. Just let them uh, do it in bed or in the ambulance or whatever. Uh, you just want to check. Again, we mentioned the uh, rock hard abdomen. That goes back to my hand on. Uh, I haven't. I looked at these slides real quickly, so I may be ahead of myself sometimes. So I apologize. But if you just keep your hand there gently and say, you tell them you're going to do it, you just don't slide it in there. You just sort of push it on there and just. Uh, I'm going to put a little pressure here once in a while just to feel if I can feel the baby move or contractions. And I've never had any trouble doing that, uh, and no one object to it that I'm aware of. <coughs> okay. Now, based on your assessment. Again, remember you're a team. You're going to have uh, your partner and, and maybe a fireman there, but you're also just a phone call away from Bonner General. So uh, if you're out in Hope or somewhere else or something, you might be a little bit farther away. So you can call Bonner General and ask, this is what I got going on. We're starting down the road. I don't know how the, where the pet and ready comes when they come to Hope, but where, you, where they come from. So you can ask, let's meet somewhere in between. So you've got your paramedic part of the team. You also have Bonner General. So this is what I've got going on. Um, do you think it's safe to transport, or should we deliver here and wait for the paramedic, or what? So that's when you want to look. Someone's got to look underneath the sheet and see if you see him crowning or see him a lot of fluid or bleeding or whatever, because she's not going to know. And usually the, the husband or the partner really doesn't know either. So someone's got to take a look and sort of just spread the, the legs apart gently and sort of just look and make sure what if anything's coming out of the vagina? Prolapsed cord, bleeding, meconium, whatever. Contractions can be 
Uh, I went around and around with my wife, so she missed a few medical school lectures, I think, and I lost every argument with her. But anyway, you can ask the, uh, how far apart are the contractions, try and time them when you're there. And you can do that pretty quickly in your five or ten minute evaluation when you first get there. Uh, it's pretty easy to keep your hand on the uterus and tell me when a contraction start from a woman's perspective. Tell me when you think a contraction start. And she can probably feel it before you can. But just ask him so you can start timing so you've got a partner there who's writing all this down. Um, he, instead of you looking at your watch, he or she can look at the watch, say they're five minutes, three minutes, two minutes. The closer they are and the harder they are, every two or three minutes is active labor lasting 30 to 45 seconds and a real firm uterus. That's classic hard labor. Like my daughter was in labor for five, five hours. She got induced the night before, but she really didn't get in hard labor the next day. They ruptured her membranes. And, but she was in hard labor for five hours and no progress, so she got a C-section. But the uh, number of prior births, if she's had two or three or twins or whatever, um, that comes faster. Uh, how far are you from the hospital, which I went into with uh, I think it's if you're a little frightened and not sure whether you should transport or you should just deliver her here or take that risk or start to uh, meet the paramedic or whoever on the way, depending on where you are and what's going on. Uh, if you both have your lights on, you're going to find each other so, um, uh, and do what you want to do. Complications. Uh, you tend to want to transport a woman and a woman to lie, and the, most of them know this, but uh, lay on your left side. It's a pure anatomical decision to not lay on your left side, but sort of at least have a pillow or a sheet on your left side. Because if a woman's flat on her back, the whole weight of the uterus is on the vena cava. Less blood flow gets to the heart, less gets back to the baby. So you just want to be at about a 45 degree angle um, with a pillow or a sheet, rolled up sheet or whatever. So when you transport them, and that should be right away, when they're on the floor or in a bed, that's one of the things you should really do too. Just immediately get her off at a 45 degree angle while you're evaluating her and, and uh, you can be facing her and you can have her hand, your hand right on the abdomen or on the uterus uh, and uh, figure out what's going on. Complications. Uh, the big complication you can expect is uh, most common is delivery. Uh, chances are good you're going to be able to get to the hospital in time unless it's really getting close. How many have delivered a baby here? Oh, God, great, y'all. You're doing good. So this is a repeat. You're pros. Um, so I think the teamwork is important and never be afraid uh, to call Bonner General and usually then you can, the three of you can communicate, me and the ambulance, paramedic and Bonner General can all come up with a plan of action so you're not by yourself making a decision you're not comfortable with. All it takes is five seconds for your partner to call and say, this is what we're going on. I think it's safe to go. Go. Um, any questions or discussion you guys want to have on transport decision? Want to do? Okay. Normal delivery. Okay, I've got a kit. Uh, I don't know why these are outdated. They all <laughs> no medicine here. Uh, I'm just going to throw them qu quickly here. You've probably seen them all. These are really, uh, really waterproof sheets that you put under. And I wouldn't necessarily do it when they're in the ambulance, but I'd certainly do it in the ambulance keep your life easier. <laughs> so these are two ones that are waterproof on the bottom, different sizes. Uh, one can be for the mother, which is the bigger of the two. One can be for the baby or if you need to or just put another one on your bed or on the gurney. Here's one pair of gloves. Yeah, I know you all have gloves, so whoever's going to be handling the mother should be with sterile gloves. Your partner who's going to be bagging the placenta if it happens or any material can use your gloves that you have. Do you have sterile gloves on the bus, ambulance? Just what's in the OB, the other side. Okay. Well, there's only one set of gloves, so I just... Um, there's a scalpel, which we're going to go into in a little bit. That's a sharp scalpel. It's, it's uh, for cutting the umbilical cord. There are two umbilical clamps. They're pretty see uh, simple. Uh, one for the mother's side when you clamp the placenta, which we'll go into. One for the, the baby side. And you don't need to test it before you use it. I, <laughs> It's always humorous. Someone will say, well, I don't know if this has worked, and they close it, and you only got one left. Then you're in trouble. So don't use it till you need it. Four alcohol swipes, which are pretty straightforward. Here's an obstetrical pad uh, uh, for after delivery. Or you can put it on uh, and during transport. I'd probably use a sheet or something, because if she delivers, you'd want to have this as more absorbent. So whatever you want to choose, they all work. Uh, either have a sheet uh, or a towel between the legs or say and save this for when she actually delivers. 
Uh, here's a bulb for sucking out the uh, nasal pharynx and the oral pharynx. Uh, we'll go over that in a little bit. A couple sponges for whatever. A couple specimens bags uh, for placenta and any other material that comes out. Uh, you can, uh, they were waterproof and they got little bands on it to tie them up to transport. She, she happens to deliver. Don't worry about the placenta. If it comes out, bag it. If she doesn't come out, keep going. Uh, we'll go into delivery in a second. Uh, this one is something, I haven't seen this, they have a, a little cape or thing in front, I, I just, but anyway, this apron. is the new apron. Now are, they have a, a full bunny suit. So oh, do they piece, really? Yeah, zip and then the full space mask. <laughs> okay. <Yes>. Anyway, okay. <laughs> I mean, this isn't Mars, you don't have to look like a Martian coming out there with a full bunny suit. Uh, I mean, this is normal labor and delivery, but this is in, it was in there, so. Uh, if you want to use it, I would use it, but I'm not sure if I'd wear the whole suit with that craziness. There actually was a time back in the early 90s when we did do that. And uh, the reason we did that was HIV, when HIV was really first discovered in the first 90s. And uh, we had uh, down at Sacred Heart, we didn't know, someone would drop in with no medical care, and there's no way to tell if they had HIV. And those who've done delivery, I mean, there's blood flying all over the place. So actually the hospital for, I don't know how many days, I don't know how many times, but they actually did have a zoot suit where we had to do that with a hood and all that. And we were, everybody was scared back then because no one really knew how AIDS was transmitted. And, uh, and pregnant women didn't know they had AIDS, their boyfriends brought it home or whatever. So uh, for a while we actually did that and I hated it. So I'm glad we're away from those days. Even if I have an HIV patient, which we had quite a few, not quite a few, but a number, we would not do anything different nowadays, uh, starting in 2000, uh, 2007 to 10. We'd wear the uh, 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 mask, more or less, and gown up, but not anything for anything really special. Any questions about the kit or what's in the kit? kit. Um, yeah, we've mentioned a lot of these. Uh, <laughs> Don't, uh, let, don't let the mother go to the bathroom. If she pushes the baby out in the bed or the floor or the gurney, uh, fine. Uh, don't try and hold the legs together, it's not gonna work. Um, be careful, uh, they tend, sometimes when they're scared like that, they tend to kick. So you wanna keep the, not kick, you know, kick, kick, but they just, ah! And if your partner or you in the way, just sort of make sure you're sort of aware of that, because it's just a normal uh, response to discomfort and uh, so your partner should be, if you're doing the delivery, it's nice to have the partner there sort of just watching. As long as she brings her legs together or something, that's fine, but sometimes, ah, I'd be lying if I haven't been kicked a couple of times, so. Any questions about the precautious deliveries? Uh, or there's comments some other people who've done, since a lot of you've done deliveries and been through it. Um, any comments you'd like to make or? Make my life easy today, you're all pros. Okay, uh, delivery precautions. Again, we talked about some of these things. You don't want to do an exam internally because you really don't know what you're feeling. Uh, maybe some of you do, but most don't. Uh, consider the limitation of the scene. Be respectful. Uh, use a sheet to cover her up, whether it's on the side of the road or in the ambulance or on a bed or on the floor. Be respectful. Cover up with a towel. And uh, just say, I just have to make sure nothing's coming and there's no bleeding or whatever, and just take a flashlight if it's night. Don't be afraid to use a, a little flashlight, just take a look and see and the, make sure the lips of the vagina are still closed and whatever color's coming out, coming out, or nothing's coming out, so check that. Again, we mentioned contact, medical, whatever your protocol, I don't know if there is a protocol, is there, when you on delivery? I haven't heard, I didn't, uh, last year or two I haven't heard of one, but uh, you're not by yourself, and I can't stress that enough. You don't have to be the lone ranger out there. Call ahead of time. Uh, what's going on, the history, uh, what the patient's feeling, what your thoughts are on it, and the three of you communicate and go from there. Uh, control the scene. Uh, I'm going to spend a little time here because the scene is different. Every case is different. And I appreciate those who have delivered in the field to uh, speak up after I get done saying if you, and tell me what your experiences are or if you want to change or add anything. You want to make sure it's safe. So that's the first thing, put a sheet in at the bed. The lots of them are on the floor. They can be in the bathtub. I've seen it all. 
Uh, so, but you want to control the scene, you and your partner. So put a sheet under or a towel under. Privacy, discomfort, respect what's going on. Don't be afraid, that, but you always want to tell them, this is what I'm doing, this is why I'm doing it. I'm taking a look, I'm going to have a flashlight, I want to see the color of the fluid, which you can't see on the sheets over the lady. Um, we actually have a bit in the hospital, they all have big lights lots of times, and you can actually use those. Um, the mother wants to be on, uh, on her back. Um, again, the 45 degree angle, which they don't uh, hear, but even you can deliver a lady in a 45 degree angle real easy. Uh, you can deliver them in the knee chest, you can, I've delivered them in every way known to mankind. So you can deliver a baby anyway. If it's coming out, it's going to come out. But I like to have them on their back because I control a little bit better. I have the sheet or a blanket uh, from the buttocks to their shoulders, so if it takes two or three blankets or two or three pillows, it takes whatever it takes. Um, and you want the knees far apart at 45 degree, and roughly a 45 degree angle. And monitor contractions, talk to her all the time. I think key is not just waiting. You gotta say that you're fine, your baby's fine, or you're doing good. Uh, just keep talking to her and what you're doing and why you're doing it. Again, elevate the hips, which goes to that 45 degree angle. And, uh, and the reason that is, uh, I think if you're on the floor or in the ambulance, it's nice to get, it doesn't really, it doesn't make, it makes it a little bit easier on you that her buttocks are up the air, off the air for, you know, four or five inches instead of sinking down into the gurney or sinking down into a bed. It's nice to have more control over it. So if the baby comes out, which we're going to go into in a few minutes, as it comes out, you've got that added four or five inches uh, and if you've seen a delivery in the hospital, and some of you've had deliveries recently, the, um, most beds are pretty firm, so you're not sinking way down. So there is a reason for that. Um, <coughs> procedures, or what have you guys done, or anything you want to add to, you come on scene and she's going to deliver, or you think she's going to deliver, anything else you did, or something different, or should, we should consider? Comments? Okay, this sort of gives you an idea of the sterile field, which we also mentioned. You've got two towels down there. The, um, you want a bigger towel, and I would put a big sheet or blanket on the bottom, then put your towel. You can have one up here and have a two of them or whatever. The sheet, a big sheet across here is not necessarily, if that's what you do, that's what you do. I'm not saying we can't do it. But if you can have one across your upper abdomen and breast and one on each leg with a towel or something, that's more ideal that you, because it gives you more room. So you're having a big blanket or a big towel you keep pushing out of the way. But you're limited to what you've got. So don't be afraid to take a, a sheet or some towels from the person house if you have that and tell them why you're doing it. So that's sort of, and I would have it a 45 degree angle, so off to the uh, left. So on the right side is I'd have this two or three, starting at the buttocks and up to the shoulder. So it's not just down here, it's the whole way so it's more comfortable for the lady. I, I, the f when they're flat and pushing, the anatomy is such the baby's head is pushing right against the vena cava as it's dropping down into the uh, pelvis. Questions? Comments? Okay, uh, this gives you an idea of what the, the crowning, what they call crowning. That's a good picture. Can everybody see that by chance? Uh, so you've got here the legs are spread apart. You've got the husband or the father up here or a partner or whoever. And you've got your partner, your other, your partner, on one side watching this leg because it's not uncommon and it's just human nature for her to just to boom, ah. So you've got to watch that. You can control it with where your arm is here and your partner's, well, it looks like someone's got their hand on the, on the foot right there. Uh, and you don't want to hold it real tight but you're trying to prevent that from getting kicked yourself or, and it's not, she's not doing it on purpose. Uh, so it's just control that uh, foot. Because if you, if you, you can put your hand and foot up here too, but it's easier to control it here so she doesn't kick out. I, I just noticed that, I hadn't seen that hand before. So if you control it up here, she can still kick up. So if you have your, your partner, so just gently, so if she does happen to do that, he's got some resistance. Now when you have the crown, this is when the baby's coming out. And you're, this is the situation, you're not going to be pulling the baby out, you're not going to be doing anything like that. So this is when the baby is crowning. And you want your hand, uh, you can probably be either side, depending on your right hand or left handed, but uh, I'm right handed. So I always rest the baby. Well, this is an old picture. How many know, people know what this is? That metal thing. I don't know when they took this one, but uh, 2005? 
Nah. Okay, this is what they call uh, uh, the way we used to do the hard tones. Before we had ultrasound, before we had those dot tones, and it wasn't that long ago <laughs> that we didn't have the dot tone. We could do in big ultrasound machines, which were ten times what they got now. I mean, it took up a whole room, and we'd hear the heartbeat, but uh, we could not, we didn't have the portable ultrasounds or the dop tone, what they call a dop tone, which everybody has now. I and mean, you can buy them on the interline so you can listen to your baby every day if you want to. Tom Cruise actually went out, Tom, one of those guys actually bought an ultrasound machine so he could look at his baby every day. But this is a, we put it around here and you wear it on your head and you had an os, uh, a stethoscope that attached right here, right down here. It was all one piece. So you put that on your head like this and you'd be down like this listening to the heartbeat because that's the only way we could hear heart tones. I've got one of these in my museum at home that I'm going to give to my kids so <laughs> you don't use them anymore. In fact, you don't even see them. But, um, and the reason you wore it on your head is it was bone, the conduction from the bone, the way they had the stethoscope here attached to this thing, actually it made a louder heartbeat sound so you could actually hear it. So back in the when. I don't know when we switched over, but actually we would put this on the husband's head and the woman's head with a long special stethoscope so she could hear her heartbeat, which there was no way for them to f hear when I started practice. When I started practice, we had, we had no ultrasound, we didn't have dop tones, we didn't have colposcopy, we didn't have laparoscopy, didn't have fetal monitors, so I'm showing my age. But that's a picture, so this picture, you would never see that again. But anyway, the, the point of the, matter, the slide is as the baby crowns out, the last motion is it's dropping down the pelvis is to hyperextend up. Uh, if it's posterior, meaning the baby's looking up, uh, it's got to do the reverse. So the baby's head comes up and two eyeballs come out here. Again, that's not, it's a technique, but you're not going to have to worry about that because it doesn't matter if it's coming, it's coming. You don't have to worry about the position. But you can see occasionally if the baby's with the, the anterior, meaning the occiput, the back of the head is on top and the eyeballs are down here and she's looking down so it's extending like this. Now the baby has to do the same thing if it's what they call posterior meaning the occiput or top of the head is back here up here is two eyeballs. And so if you haven't seen that it's sort of a frightening thing and all of a sudden the baby baby comes out and all of a sudden you got two eyes just looking right at you. Sorry about that. Uh, and that's a different position but don't worry about that but the idea you want to support the baby's head coming down here with your hand. So as the baby's crowning out, you're actually sort of not pushing the baby in, but instead of having explosive delivery and lots of lacerations, uh, vaginal lacerations, and there's also some people think that it may, um, all the pressure on the baby's head as it's coming out, um, and under lots of pressure, then you all of a sudden it, boom. Everybody worries about it, but I haven't seen any real problem with it, but it, people worry about it the release of pressure on a baby, on a fragile baby's head. So you want to control it out so it's a nice smooth delivery she's pushing out. What this does is this is a real sharp angle, the pubic symphysis. The pubic bone comes up here and goes like this. It can be a narrow arch or it can be a wide arch. Is that making sense? Uh, to the men? <laughs> Women may understand it better. But the wide arch, uh, it's less, but you've got a narrow arch by pushing this down, you listen the lacerations to the urethra and the vagina and the clitoris and the upper, upper uh, labia. If the eyeballs are coming out, you don't want to push on the eyeballs, so you just go on the sides and, and try and control it as best you can. Uh, I, I hope that wasn't too technical. Does that make sense to everybody? What the narrow arch? And lots of times the baby can get stuck here in a narrow arch, and the doctor has you use a vacuum or forceps and push the baby's head down beneath this arch because it's so tight. And that's an anatomical, two, more technique than you need to know. But if it's a real uh, tight arch and it's stuck, you're not going to deliver it anyway, so you've got to get the baby to the hospital. So I wouldn't worry about that. you just be ready to do what you got to do. Does this make sense then? Those who have delivered babies, you want to relate to your experiences or something frightening or scary? When it or? happens, when, once you get to the crowning position, it don't take long at all. On yeah, no, once you get to this point, it's going to deliver. Uh, yeah. When you got a narrow arch, it's going to be stuck. You might see an inch of a head or something like that, but you have a real narrow arch and it's stuck because the woman's pelvis arch is real tight like a triangle instead of wide open like oval. Um, it's not going to come. So, 
and you're only going to see inch or a couple three four centimeters maybe but once it gets to this stage it's coming so you want to support the baby's head so it's not explosive delivery and you want to tell her just gently push not push real hard and uh, give her some oxygen I would have oxygen on her uh, in the ambulance and if you're at uh, home uh, bring the oxygen in and have her on that too um, you can do it on either side if you're left-handed just reverse Questions? Anything else you want to add to those who've done deliveries? Okay. This sort of is the anatomical uh, position, and it's sort of showing the same thing, except doesn't this baby's up here? It's coming vertex. It was a foot lean breach, double foot lean. If it's a single foot lean, which we're going to go into a little bit later, it's not going to come out. If it's an arm leg, it's not going to come out. If it's a single foot, it's not going to come out. Prolapse cord, it's not going to come out. Your goal is to get them to the hospital and have the, uh, uh, the hospital know, I see a foot, I see a leg, I see a whatever, prolapse cord, so they can get the team in at Bonner General to do emergency C-section. This shows a side view. Your bottom hand is supporting the head down here in the rectum. Because you have an explosive delivery, you're more likely to get what they call a first, second, third degree, uh, fourth degree extension. Does, does anybody have heard those terminology before? You can get, uh, here's the urethra and bladder uh, right up here, and this is why you want to sort of uh, uh, protect that area from a laceration because if it comes out explosive or too much pressure up here, it can tear the urethra, it can tear uh, laterally, so you want to control it. Uh, there's not much room, in all honesty, between the vagina and the rectum, so you want to support this. It's not that big when it's right, when you're actually feeling it. So if you have an explosive delivery down here, a first degree is a superficial laceration. You're not, this is more than you need to know, but just so you hear. First degree is just a superficial laceration. May or may not need su uh, suturing. Not by you, but in the hospital. Second degree is deeper uh, through the mucosa. That will, need a laser, that will need some suturing. Third degree, the rectal sphincter is right here, really close to the outside of the vagina. So if you have an explosive delivery, you can tear partially or completely through the rectal sphincter. Um, you just got to, uh, and that's not something you're going to even know. I just throw the terminology out. Fourth degree is you actually tear into the rectum. So the, uh, it can be up in this region, or it can be right through the third, through the rectal sphincter and into the, the outer part of the rectum right here, or it can be pressure up here and not even involve the sphincter. But it's called a fourth degree extension. What you want to do is prevent the explosive delivery and that's why the hand sews. They coming out, tell them not to push gently, gently. And uh, say, don't push, hold on, just gently push. Push once out of th contraction the last 30, 40 seconds. They want to push real hard. Push one, then stop and relax and breathe through it. Use your, so you don't get that explosive delivery. The more kids, the more pregnancies they've had, the more children they've had, the more likely you're going to have an explosive delivery because if the pelvis has been tested and they've had a vag one or two vaginal deliveries, uh, one big push and boom. And, uh, and if it happens, it happens. Don't worry about it. Even in the best of hands, I can tell you I've, it's happened to me and I'm controlling it. And I've done a few and they still fool me. So if it happens, it happens. And you can tell when they arrive when you get to the hospital, she had an explosive delivery. She said, boom. Well, this isn't the same type picture. Uh, the head's right. Uh, looks like right hand there, he's controlling it with the hand, uh, delivery of the head. So once you deliver the head, let me see what the next slide is. Okay. Okay. Back, back. Once the head comes out, uh, in all the cases that you all have delivered babies, does the baby come out the old, oldly, totally, or did you have to do anything to get the shoulders out? Traction and shoulders came out. Okay. Never had to help okay. uh, Lots of times, baby's head will get stuck. Uh, it's called a turtle position, meaning the head comes out, usually not in the second or third pregnancy, but uh, on the first pregnancy. Uh, if the baby's pretty good sized and she's been pushing a while, the head will come out and it's called a turtle sign. I mean, the head comes out and it goes back in, or it sort of gets stuck right against the perineum. Um, 
If that happens, it, it turns into a little bit higher risk and we sort of go into... If the baby's head comes out, if the amniotic sac, amniotic sac has not broken, um, use something to break it. Uh, anything you got. If you got something sterile, ideally, just break the sac because if the baby's sac is around the, the amniotic sac around the baby's face, it can't breathe. So the minute the baby's head comes out and if the sac is still around like a balloon, whether it's clear fluid or amniotic fluid or whatever, break it uh, and go from there uh, and pull the sac around from the baby. And as the head comes out, you're going to see the umbilical cord can be, two of my three kids had the cord around the neck, one twice, one once. Um, and what you do is just take two fingers and gently lift it over the head, one, two, or whatever it is. If it's too tight, I'm not sure, the only way, you're not going to have to handle that, just let it come, wait for the next contraction, because if it's too tight, uh, sometimes what we would do in the hospital would clamp the cord on both sides because it's just, I can't lift it over, clamp it, cut it, and deliver the baby real quickly, so we're not waiting for another contraction. That's an obstetrical emergency, so uh, if you don't have that, which you're not going to be able to do, you just tell them to keep pushing. If the cord's around the neck and you can't lift it over. Uh, I'm not saying you can't, I just wouldn't cut the cord, it's, that's what we would do. Uh, does that make sense on those two? Um, as the baby's head comes out, the shoulder can, now in this case the shoulder is, is out. Now what you want to do is, with the baby's head's in there with the next contraction, sort of hold the baby's head and the shoulder can get wedged in here right through across here between the uh, pubic, uh, the sacral bone and the pubic symphysis and the real big shoulders. The shoulders rotate inside to up or down, it can get wedged in there called a shoulder dystocia. So what you want to do is grab onto the, it's probably not going to happen to you because those are usually long layers, but you want to just gently wait for the next contraction and gently take the baby's head and so just pull it down, try and get this anterior shoulder out. Then, I just, if that happens to you, but usually it doesn't. Now, there are two schools of thought on when you suction. I'm with a school of thought that uh, I like to suck on the perineum because as the, uh, when the baby's head is delivered, but the shoulders have not. So I'll take the bowl and I'll start in the mouth, go to both nasal pharynx, back to the mouth, and it takes two or three times uh, to do this. I think most of us use the same technique. The other school of thought is they'd rather get the shoulders because they don't want to get what they call that shoulder dystocia I was mentioning. Uh, and the longer that it's inside the um, uh, vagina, the more likely you are to get a shoulder dystocia. Um, so this is the, what the bulb, and what I like to do is put the baby in the nasal pharynx. So I go in the mouth first because that's the baby's uh, the lungs are full of amniotic fluid. The mouth is full of amniotic fluid, as is the nasal pharynx. So I would start in the mouth, and I push the bulb, and I go let the bulb out as I, um, I'm bringing the bulb out slowly, trying to get as much in the cheeks, back of the oral pharynx, both cheeks, instead of you know, sucking in and put it out, and sucking it in, in and out. I take my time, sort of judge, not my time. I mean, I'm doing it pretty quick, you know, a matter of seconds, but. Uh, I try to do it less time. I don't want to traumatize the, the oral pharynx. And I'll judge how many times I've got to do that based on how full the uh, mouth is. If the mouth's not full, then I go to one pharynx and then the other, uh, the nasal pharynx, and try and just suck out there, suck out there, and then go back in here before the shoulder's delivered. Um, a lot of people will get the shoulder first, which is fine. Uh, I, I'm comfortable with my skills that I like that first and then I'll, and there's data support, it probably doesn't make any difference, but that's what I do. But for you all, what I would do is, uh, when the, we get the shoulder first and uh, suck out the mouth, usually two, three times, once or twice for the mouth, then go to the nose, back to the third time, back to the mouth, and maybe back to the nose, depending on how much fluid. And then, and you tell her not to push, tell them you're suctioning your baby out of the amniotic fluid, and, um, Go from there. Any comments on those who've done deliveries, what you've done, or questions or comments? I have a question. Do you have to empty that then each yes. time? Yes. Okay. As you're coming out, you, and I'm pushing it, and I squeeze it down, and I'm coming out like this.
throw it to the side. And that's what I judge how many times I do it. So if I go in like this, and I empty it, and there's nothing there, then I go, okay, I'm going to the nose. So I'll go to the nose. Start with the mouth, I go to the nose once or twice. And usually there's not much in the nose, and go back to the mouth. And then I say, and that all, oh, it doesn't take more than, seems like a long time, but it really is probably five, ten seconds. Uh, going from there. Then you can give them that for a souvenir because the mothers like to have that to clean out the oral pharynx when they're at home. <coughs> Questions or comments from those who've done deliveries? What they've done, their experience? Want to share with us? Okay. Okay, this is what uh, I was mentioning a few seconds ago. Once the shoulder comes out underneath this pubic symphysis, it's not wedged in here, the shoulder dystocia, it's come underneath the pubic symphysis. You've done your suction and you're supporting the baby's head, gently guiding it down. You, you, you gotta first bring it down so the shoulder comes out and then you deliver the posterior shoulder. So you wanna get on, uh, right there and down. It's not dramatic, but down and up and out. Questions, thoughts? And usually you can get a tear here. You can see the, the, the shoulders are the widest part of the head, or the body. Once the head comes out, you can still get these lacerations. So you want to support the shoulders. You can see his fingers up here, and as the baby's head comes out, and then you're going to put your fingers right up here and support this shoulder so it's not an explosive uh, delivery again because this is the widest part. And you can get a, a third or fourth degree extension with the head or the shoulder. If it happens, it happens. It's, it's, not, it's not because of bad technique. It's because the shoulders uh, or the head are bigger than the vagina, which everybody knows, but if it's not thinned out and it's explosive, or even when it's well controlled, uh, it happens. With my son, I put very gentle pressure on the shoulders, right. and he just shot out. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> No, 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 that's what I'm saying. It, it, lots of times, even I'm, I think I'm controlling it pretty good, and even after 30 years, they can st they still fool me. So, and that's why I'd like to deliver in bed or in a gurney, because if you're in the, uh, when I first started practice, it was delivery room beds, and there were women's with stirrups, and there was nothing below you. I mean, I never dropped a baby, but it always worried me, because the, these explosive delivery, all of a sudden, like a football coming at you, and you're ready to go, and all of a sudden, she pushes out, and go, oh! So it's nice to have that gurney or the bed or the floor or whatever to sort of help it if it does get and it's slippery. Don't think it's not really slippery. Okay, <clears throat> again, uh, you're supporting the head. You don't want the head flying around the place. So you always have one, at least one hand on the head um, and the other hand's on the posterior shoulder here or, and you're sort of let, guiding it out. And you're going to have the bed down here. So uh, it really is a lot easier than uh, trying to catch it when it's all wet and you got rubber gloves on. And so you can let them slide out right onto the bed. And it works out very nicely because you got a sterile sheet down here. <coughs> Questions, comments? Okay, continuation of the process. You can see the placenta is still up here. The placenta can be posterior, it can be anterior. You really don't know where it is. Um, it could be, any, I mean, the doctor probably knows because the ultrasound will tell you, but you're not going to have access to that. So you want to control the head at all times. You want to control the body. And uh, this is the way you do it if you're in stirrups, but in all honesty, I sort of, it's not that dramatic. You sort of, I just let them slide out onto the bed. Don't hesitate to use the bulb a couple, three times just to make sure. And if you go in there and stick out the oral pharynx and there's nothing there, there's nothing there. Better be safe than sorry, but you don't want them to aspirate inside. And if you think they did, but when you're on your way to the end to the hospital, tell them, hey, uh, she had meconium, or I think uh, she may have aspirated some, I don't know. And the beauty of that is, and the, the team's on, on alert at, home, at the hospital, but they can get respiratory therapy, they can get whatever they need or what they need here uh, to help you out. So don't hesitate to say, there wasn't much amniotic fluid, or there was, or there was meconium, there wasn't, and so they are aware of what's going on. Okay, again, we talked about partner. 
Uh, you want to keep the baby level. You don't want it way down. That's the beauty of a bed, uh, the gurney, because it's level with the mother. And as long as that cord's attached, the baby's getting blood. A lot of people want to clamp the cord. It's just human nature to get the clamp cord. I tend to wait for the cord to stop clamping, uh, pulsating. You put your finger on the uh, umbilical cord, and it can be a minute or it can be four or five minutes. You just never know. But as long as that cord is pulsating, that tells you the placenta is still attached. That tells you the mother, in that transition, that two, three, five minutes or whatever it is, uh, the, mother, the baby's getting blood from the mother, which is still good and healthy. And you've got oxygen going on the mom, which we talked about. So that's good. So I don't clamp the cord unless I'm forced to for one reason or another. Uh, clamp the cord until it stops pulsating. One exception is it's a real short cord. So uh, let's see. If uh, this is a long cord, but lots of times, uh, not lots of times, but occasionally uh, the cord is real short. If it's a real long cord, it can be wrapped around an arm, it can be wrapped around the neck. If it's a real short cord, this is a tight, it's not loose like this. So if the baby comes out, but the cord is right here, and the baby, you deliver everything, and all of a sudden you've got it three inches between the vagina and the baby because you've got to hold it sideways because the cord is right there then I would clamp and cut the cord if it's a real short cord. So don't be afraid to cut it. And a lot of people like to cut it. I, should, I don't know what the percentage is, but that's a discussion that keeps going on. I think more of us, uh, but not all of us, wait till the cord is not pulsing. Uh, it's a short cord, and you don't have the room to maneuver to dry the baby off, to suck it out, and it's only got two, three, four inches or six inches, but it's real short, and you know it's short, so you can't let the baby lie down on the, on the gurney because it's putting really a lot of tension, clamp and cut. And these things, I've never seen one fail, and uh, the only times I've seen it fail is when someone checks it to make sure it's going to close. If it's closed, it's not open. So it will close down. Uh, a word of caution here. Uh, if it's a short cord, instead of a long cord, the cord can actually break, uh, even in the best of hands. So I mean, we sometimes this cord is so short, you know, it'll pull off. So you, you've got to keep that in your back of your mind, um, and uh, so be ready to have your partner again. Be ready with the clamps because you don't know until the baby comes out what's going to happen. So just be ready to go quickly if it's a real short cord. So if that we'll, does happen, then do you just clamp it as close to the baby as yeah. you can? Close. You like to give the, the uh, ideally six inches, four to six inches. So when you clamp the cord, there may be a slide of that. I don't know if I, I just can't remember. But you want to give the, the hospital four to six inches. And the reason you want to give them four to six inches is if, for whatever reason, they've got to start an IV, it's difficult in the baby except for the umbilical vein. And you can place a little catheter down there. Um, and if it's a real short cord and it breaks right next to the baby, or you cut it real short, you can have problems, uh, not you, but at the hospital, the pediatrician, or whoever. So try and give them four to six inches if you can. And if it's a short cord, try and cut as close to the vagina as you can, so you give them as much umbilical cord on the baby as they need. They may not need it. They may just cut it when they get there. Uh, most umbilical cords, so those who've had babies, are probably, they probably put an inch or two. But they usually don't do that until they sort of really diving low and it's going fine. Yeah, I'm sure there's a slide on that. Now, if it breaks like that, though, and the, and the side that's towards the placenta retracts back into the uterus and you can't see it, um, is there a risk it. for the mom? No. No. Okay. Yeah, it bleeds a lot more. And that happens. Yeah. Um, uh, and if you uh, if you have one clamp on the baby side, you don't want the baby to bleed out. Right. Now, the placenta is going to pulsate. It's going to stay attached generally. It may stay attached for a long time, but it's only going to pulsate for three, you know, one minute or three or four minutes. So the worst thing is you've got the uh, umbilical cord just like an arterial bleeder, but you know it's going to stop in five minutes. It's sort of frightening when you see a lot of blood, as you all know, but uh, don't reach up and try and find it. I mean, if I was in the hospital and I had her legs up, I might do that, but you're not going to have that luxury and you don't want to mess around with it, but it will stop. She might leave a little more blood loss but not enough to make any big difference. It's not like a preview or an eruption, which we'll go into here. Uh, 
Uh, sort of a summary. Oh, I guess I we've done that one. Again, have your partner do the uh, writing down of the notes, time of delivery, um, bleeding, mild, moderate. And that's your call. You can say a lot. It might be a lot if you've never seen it before. Uh, that's okay. Uh, make sure you mention it. Uh, keep the infant level. And uh, so I usually don't cut the cord because it's often, the cord's not long enough to put it up in the mother's chest. So I will keep it in the gurney or on the bed, stop pulsating, clamp it, cut it, put the mother, because actually this is a very warm spot. And uh, make sure the baby, like say, is hits off to the side. She don't want it face first against the breast or against the chest. So just keep a mantra deck and you can suction periodically uh, and stuff like that. But you're not going to be able to get the baby up generally. On occasion you might, but that would be you're better off just stabilizing the baby, drying the baby off, putting a cap on. Because you're only talking about two or three minutes. And she's going to be reaching down to try and grab that baby. That's just human nature again. So you say, oh, oh, we're just relax here. Let's We're doing this and we'll put the baby up in your chest. And then put in a warm blanket right over her. Okay, we sort of talked about this as a better picture. Four to six inches. If the baby comes out and you're like this and it's right up against the perineum and you can't pull it anymore, don't pull on it. Uh, why does this cord break? Because of the jerk at the end. <laughs> you, you, gotta think, you, don't want to, you don't want to pull on it. Yeah, just, and I've told medical students and interns that this is standard line. They never, have, they never know the answer unless they know someone who's been with me for a delivery. Because the jerk at the end who just pulls too hard, then it gets in trouble. So just be aware of it. Okay, delivery of the placenta. Uh, again, you don't pull on it. Again, uh, you, the baby can be out, resting on the baby's chest. The cord is clamped, coming out the perineum, uh, whatever length it is. And you're still going to have bleeding as the placenta separates which we're going to go into in a few seconds, but the uh, it can still bleed real heavily. You've never seen a delivery. I mean, you can lose a lot of blood real fast, and it's sort of scary. Uh, and you're going to massage the uterus, which we'll go into. If the placenta comes out, you got a bag for the placenta uh, to put it in. Again, you work as a team. No, but don't pull on it. Don't pull on it in parades. You're going to see the maternal side, and not the the amniotic sac is up inside. The placenta is coming down, and it's going to be look like a, a raw muscle. It's going to be ugly, and it's not pretty. This is shiny and pretty, in my mind. <laughs> but the, the Duncan or the maternal side is where it was attached to the uterus. And it's just, you know, 12, 15 centimeters circle, and it's just nothing wrong. It's just uh, the maternal side. It looks like uh, raw meat. I mean, it's just it's ugly. But it's no, it doesn't make any difference. It's, it's just taking. Pardon me? Okay. After the uh, delivery procedures, uh, keep massaging the uterus, and it can bleed pretty heavily, you know, passing clots. As the uterus fills up uh, with blood, it takes a minute or two for it to clot. So she can be passing huge clots, or it can be just like a stream. Either way is fine. Uh, just uh, keep massaging that uterus. Uh, you can put her legs down flat in the bed or a small, you know, not as 45 degree angle. You can let go of the legs, your partner, and just keep looking with a flashlight or whatever you're doing uh, so you can see how much blood she's losing. Keep massaging that uterus. Your partner's going to record the time of delivery, time of placenta, write down anything the delivering uh, person says. Uh, she bled more than I think, or uh, I left six inches of cord, or whatever. Just have your partner document that. Uh, respect her dignity, so if you're in the ambulance or home or whatever, get some sheets and, and protect her. But that you, you have to look, so don't be afraid to lift your legs up, uh, Joan or whatever, and I want to take a look and see if you're not bleeding. That, that, that's not a problem, it's just a matter of respect and telling her what you're doing. Um, again, the 500 cc's or a pint of blood is, uh, is expected, 500 to 750, I would say. Uh, which is a lot of blood if you're not used to seeing that kind of blood in a short period of time. You can lose a lot more than that. And that's a judgment call on your part. And for those who haven't seen a whole lot, if you think it bled a lot, just say I bled a lot. It doesn't make any difference. 
they're going to check it anyway. But uh, again, the blood loss, if it's like a steady st clots, that means it's not bleeding a whole lot and you're passing the clots. If it's a stream, uh, you want to massage that uterus. You have to be aware of shock if she's continuing to bleed. And by that time, you're usually probably going to have your paramedic with you, hopefully, so the two of you are all working as a team. But um, massage the uterus. And the biggest problem, which is rare, uh, is shock. Uh, is try and start an IV if you can, just so you can give them some fluids. You're not going to get in trouble by giving them a liter or two. You're not, it shouldn't be taking that long. I don't know how far it is from you from the hospital when you get there, but it shouldn't be that long. And a liter of fluid can't, uh, can't hurt anything. Be prepared to push fluids. Uh, if you think they're shock and your blood pressure is dropping, again, you're not by yourself. You've got your team in the ambulance. You've also got the doctor at the emergency room. Hey, your blood pressure is 90 over 50. I'm, I've got D5W or whatever you've got going. Should I push it up? Should I push it? And you're never going to have to push it down. <laughs> Should I give her or open it wide? But you don't have to make that call by yourself. Call the hospital, talk to the uh, emergency room doctor, and uh, go from there. And treat with shock if you need to. Legs elevated, head down, stuff like that. Questions? That's what we talked about, control bleeding. To me, that's scary to have a mask and eyeglass. <coughs> and go, I don't know. Oh, man. Um, gown, okay. But you want to massage, you want to knead like your dough. Those who have made bread, you just want to knead that uterus. Um, and the, mo the baby's up here. Legs are down. You've got some pads down here. And you actually, uh, for those who had babies, do you know what I'm talking about? The nurse needing the uterus after delivery? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're shaking their head. They know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, but that's what you have to do. Tell them what you're doing and why you're doing it, and it's going to hurt with no epidural or caudal. No question about it. No wise comments from any males in the background back there. <laughs> I guess. Uh, okay, just, I expect some, but. Okay, that's sort of the end of the, uh, the OB technical portion of it. We're going to go into emergencies and stuff like that, but normal delivery. Those who have done delivery, any comments or thoughts you want to share with your group or what I've said or reinforce what I've said or not said? No, it's not silly. On the hemorrhagic shock for these guys, right. are we going, so we use, you know, 20 to 30 cc's per kilogram basis, are we going on um, normal body weight or are we going I go with pregnant body weight. It's not going to change that much. Okay. And uh, after delivery, you may have uh, a placenta weighing a pound or two or three, and you may have a seven pound or an eight pound baby, but that's 10 pounds. And 140 or 50 pound women or bigger, 10 pounds is nothing. Okay. So I'd go by whatever weight she tells your last doctor's visit was. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Comments, anybody, or questions, or reinforcements, or? Uh, thank you for bringing that. That's an excellent point. This is her baby. This is her delivery. And as um, uh, emergency responders, you want to respect their dignity and their privacy. And I think if it's just the partner and a couple paramedics, um, it, it's just, it hurts her call. And if she says, I'm too hot, uh, and rips it off, that's her call. I would document that in the thing so they can't come back at you later and say, oh, they were just left me uncovered. So if she says that, I absolutely respect that and I think that's an excellent comment and I have no problem, no sheet or whatever, um, as long as they're making the call. But I would document it just to cover your own butt uh, uh, to do that. Again, documentation is important. That's why you've got a partner. Other comments? Good comments. Good questions? Okay. The newborn, we sort of a lot of this is recovered. Recovered, dry, keep them dry, cap on the head. Repeat suctioning, even though they're on the mother's chest. How often do you suction? I think it's a judgment call on your part. But every minute, a couple minutes, when you're first starting out, the, you've got, uh, we'll go into the APGAR score in a minute, but the first four or five minutes is when they're going to be spitting up that amniotic fluid out of their lungs. So the first few minutes, 
do it more frequently. And if things get comfortable and the baby's crying, I, don't, I love a baby crying. I have absolutely no problem with babies crying like crazy. That tell me they're healthy and, and life's good. So I don't really have a problem with that. Um, so suction as need be. It doesn't hurt the suction. I've never seen any problem with suction. So suction as much as you want or as little, but err on the side of over suctioning than under suctioning, especially on transport. And you know how difficult it is when the ambulance is going 50, 60, for whatever it is on a bumpy road if you're out in a gravel road. It's not as easy as it seems. I've done it and I've seen it done. So uh, err on the side of caution. Keeping the head covered. If you don't have a, a cap, do the best you can to try and keep it dry and warm. Again, that sort of suction is the new one. We've sort of covered that in detail. Uh, they're suctioning the oral pharynx. It's nice to put a finger in. That's, that's I did not mention. That's a good slide to remind me. You don't want to just shove this tube in there, um, especially when the baby's crying or this mouth closed. So you want to put a finger gently in the one side so that uh, they don't have any teeth. So you're not going to have a bite. But you want to open that mouth so when you put the, t the suction in there, now you can't do that on the perineum when the baby's head's coming out because you just don't have the number t enough fingers and hands. But when the baby is resting on the mattress or on the mama's breast or whatever, or, or chest, I would put a finger in there so you're not just shoving that in, you're protecting it a little bit. And gently go in and just go back, you don't force it. I like to go in the back of the oral pharynx. On the nose you can only get in maybe a third of a centimeter, can't get in very far. With the mouth, you can really push it too far back. So you want to go, when you get resistance, suck and bring it out. And that finger is helpful when they're on the bed or chest. APGAR, I'm not, I don't think you have to worry about APGAR because you don't, you're not familiar enough with it, but Virginia APGAR started this back in the 40s. It was still used today. Um, all babies get an APGAR score. And, uh, and Virginia APGAR is the woman doctor uh, who, pediatrician who came up with it. That's what I call it, the appearance. When babies are uh, born, if you have a bright light, uh, initially they're gonna, the trunk is going to be pink, but the arms are going to be blue or less pink. So you've got a score of zero, one, or two. I'm not going to go in the different way to do that because uh, you don't really have to do that because it's not valid because you don't see enough of them. But the AA is for appearance and uh, color. But you can expect the baby to be uh, hopefully a pink chest but the legs and arms are lots of times will be dusty or blue or something like that. And that goes into auction, which we'll go into in a few seconds. But you can have blow by. O2 pulse is the baby's pulse. You get that by putting your finger on the umbilical cord. Because you can feel once it's been separated, um, separated from the mother, the umbilical cord still pulsates on the fetal side. But that's the baby's heart rate. So as the baby is one of you, whoever is doing the delivery, once a minute or whatever, I just put my fingers on the um, umbilical cord next to the abdomen of the baby and count for a minute or usually 30 seconds or 15, 20 seconds and multiply it. But uh, that's the abgar. You want it above 100. Grimace, I mean, that, and that's what I mentioned earlier. I love babies crying. The more they cry, uh, the better it is. The more they cry, they get a, a two score. The less they cry, they may get a one. If they're not crying, they're just lethargic, they're getting a zero. Uh, activity. Uh, the baby can move its trunk, a baby can move the extremities, so activity is mainly the activities of them stretching, reaching out. Again, uh, two is the top score, a lot of good motion on all four extremities. One is decreased motion or no mo and no motion is zero. Uh, respiratory, again you want to have them 30-40 uh, respiration, babies breathe real fa fast so you count the respirations and you can sort of do that with the on the chest too. And you get zero for two or respiratory effort, zero. If no respiratory effort, minim minimal is one and a good is two. So that's just so you can hear it. But no one's gonna ask you to give an app, I don't think. Has anybody been asked to give an APGAR score? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, oh good, okay, I apologize. Um, again, that's more of a judgment call on your part. And if you have a partner, you can say, heartbeat is this, color is this, I'm giving a one for, and this is why I'm doing it. So. Uh, so I, I apologize for that, but Amy. They've, they've had us do it twice. Good. No, that is great. Five minutes, and then yeah, one minutes. and five minutes. Yeah. One, five, and ten yeah. is the most common. Of what I've seen. So I think if you feel comfortable doing that, and they've taught you how to do it, fantastic. I'm uh, happy. 
Um, but you put down zero, one, or two, and why? So and your partner says, I'm, I'm giving a one because it's not real. I don't think it's real vigorous. You know, zero, one. If there's no, that's easy. That's zero. So if you've got a form on your uh, uh, form that you use, you can very quickly go down zero, one, or two. And if you give it a zero or one, I would put a little note to the side. And uh, so that's outstanding. Thank you for pointing that out. Questions on the APGAR score that you've had, that you've been taught, and done? If the baby doesn't breathe, the two most common things, uh, what I like to do generally is, I first, I just, I just grab the thing, I just go like this two or three times on both foot. That generally mostly gets them going. Uh, if that doesn't go on, then I go up, and, and the two techniques are circular around this, or you can go up and down the back. Either one works. So you can be, uh, if they're on the gurney, on the mother's chest, it's easy just uh, going around and step here. But this is what I usually do first, just to get them attention. Not real hard. Uh, I'm not slapping the baby's butt, and I'm not hitting the baby's foot. I'm just sort of using two fingers and clicking it. And sometimes I'll go up and down, and then hit it, and then up and down and hit it. And hopefully that generally will take care of it. If it doesn't, then I'll go to this. Whether it's a circle or up and down, they both work. If it doesn't work, then you got problems. That's when you hope your paramedic is around to take over. That's supposed to be a joke. Okay. Uh, the uh, inverted triangle of resuscitation has sort of been around for a long time. Uh, I can't say that I haven't done a delivery in three years, so, but it, the idea is the same if they're not using the same thing. Essentially, we talked about suction, dry, and warming. And I think putting below by oxygen on every baby is probably not a bad idea. You're not going to hurt anything. Um, you blow by. And then there's mask ventilation, and there's chest compression, intubation, and medications. Um, of those of you who've done delivery, how many have had to do chest compressions or intubations? Pretty rare. Uh, mask ventilation. Uh, blow by, when you got oxygen, blow by, they've got a mask and just sort of rest as the baby's breathing. Either one works fine. Uh, again, uh, slow or shallow breathing or no breathing. Uh, you want to do artificial uh, pushings. And the way I like to do it is put my hands, uh, two, fing two or three fingers on the back and the finger my thumbs on the sternum. Uh, different ways they'll show it like this, but if you support the back, if they're on the gurney or the bed, uh, and you're pushing in, I, I think you're pushing the baby into the bed, and I like to have three fingers like this, and just use my thumbs, just boom, 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 and that works pretty good. In fact, it, always, it does work. Um, but if the, you don't have this, uh, in my opinion, if you don't have this support, if you're not on a board or if you're not on the uh, if you're just in a bed of gurney, you're just pushing the baby into the bed. And I'd rather control it a little bit better. And you don't have to push it in all the way and break the sternum. You just, you know, a third of the way down, uh, boom, boom, boom. And, and you can count out loud or you can have your partner count out loud so that you're getting uh, 60 uh, ventilations. And you recess, you reassess, you know, so you do it for 30, 45 seconds, stop and see what happens. 15 seconds, boom, boom, boom. Keep going. And you keep going all the way to the hospital. And it's easy to do on a gurney or a bed by that technique with three fingers back here and boom. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, okay, if the rest heart rate is less than 100, you go back to the ventilations, same type thing, less than 100 beats a minute, you do the same thing. So when you're pushing on the baby's sternum, you're affecting the lungs and the heart. So you're doing both at one time. It's not like uh, uh, an adult where you've got both going on. It makes it easier with the baby because they're really pretty small. So as you're pushing in on the sternum, the mid part of the sternum, you're doing both are toward the mid part, upper third, bump, bump, bump. Uh, you're getting both the heart and the lungs. And you can count uh, and reassess again every 30, 45 seconds. Uh, your partner can count the, uh, the respirations while you've you got your fingers on the umbilical cord for 10 seconds, multiply times six, and you've got your heartbeat. In the only place you're going to hear the heartbeat or uh, feel it is in the umbilical cord. Okay. Okay, then that goes to the compression. They say, say a rate of 120. 
if it was less than 60 or 80, but essentially, uh, if you've got a heartbeat and there's no heartbeat, you can go jump up to 120 uh, for the compressions for the heart if there's actually no heartbeat at all, or zero or 30 beats a minute. But you can do pretty much, you just speed up the rate, respirations versus the heart, so it's, I still do it in the same way, uh, same location. Okay, so that's sort of, it was less than 60, which we saw you just keep, you just start and keep going and reassess every 30, 45 seconds. Um, again, I think blow by oxygen is not going to hurt anything, so you can have your partner with a little, with the hose or the cannula. And a little blow by is not going to cause any problem if you can uh, in the first five, ten minutes. So it says wait till they start. Or I wouldn't wait, I just started right then. Some doctor might disagree with me, but I think that's not going to hurt anything. Questions on that little resuscitation, those that have done some uh, on the newborn? Comments, thoughts, suggestions? Would you also use that little baby BVM while the, when they were talking ventilations and heart compressions, you were basically talking about the compressions, but would you... You had the people use the BVM as well? Yeah, well, our blow by oxygen. You can, that you attach, you just put it over there. You can call it a blow by, you can put the infant right up here so you can ambu them or whatever you need to do to do that. But, uh, but if the baby's breathing, uh, not breathing, but the heart rate's nice and strong, you're just pushing the chest in, you're, you're compressing the lungs. So a lot of times that just, and you sort of move up the ladder or down the ladder. So and that's sort of what I think I tried to point out. Maybe if I wasn't successful, I'll go over it again. Sort of start simple. Check it every 30 seconds and keep moving up. And I usually have, uh, I would have them have the blow by oxygen right there while you're doing it. Yeah. And then if you get to the point where they're not breathing and there's no heartbeat, then you've got to have the ambu bag and bump, 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 and bump, 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 both at the same time. And that's when you need a partner. Questions? Thoughts? Comments? Breach presentation, uh, we sort of went for that. It means that the uh, leg is coming out, a foot's coming out, uh, a compound presentation, a foot and an arm, or a foot lean breach, or a arm breach, uh, or a butt first, it can be anything. Uh, there's greater risk of trauma whenever you that because that, you've got a huge space in there and you've got evidence of a prolapsed cord. Prolapsed cord means the cord's coming out with the arm or the leg or both, or, so that's why I don't hesitate to look with a flashlight to see if you see the umbilical cord, you see a foot, hand, or whatever, or butt. Uh, emergency care, you put it, I would do this for anybody but in labor and delivery, and you probably do, is put a mother on oxygen anyway for the transport, transport immediately. Then you put the head down, so you want them up in the knee chest position, which we'll go into in a second. So you want, ideally, uh, when the baby, even on a 45 degree angle with the malpresentation, you've got more and more baby pressing on the vena cava. So we flip them over in the knee chest, and uh, you're still looking with your flashlight periodically to see what's going on. But that takes the baby, when the mother's shoulders are down on the bed and the butt is up in the air, the baby's more like, hopefully, going to stay higher up inside the uterus and higher up off the vena cava and less coming out. Um, and if a leg's coming out or an arm, you don't want to pull on it or butt. Uh, if you deliver a breach, if it's a butt delivery, what they call a frank breach, and they come out, delivery is the same, only you've got a butt coming out instead of a head. You don't, you just sort of control it the same way uh, until the head comes out. And the butt's bigger than the pelvis when it comes out of breach, is bigger than the head. So it's really rare to have the head smaller than that. So usually by the time the head rare, can get stuck in there. So, but if it happens, it's not, it's out of your hands. But if it, uh, usually it just all comes out pretty quickly. But you don't want to pull on the baby because that just causes problems. I think there's a, Okay, that's what that what prolapse cord looks like. And you can get a prolapse cord when the head's coming down. If the head's real high, and that was a big fear of my daughter, ha I had for my daughter, which didn't happen, because it was stuck up in the, what they call the inlet of the pelvis, and the head wasn't dropping, so that still left a lot of space around that baby for that cord to come out. So, and that's what a prolapse cord is. So you look down, you see, you don't have to see this much. It can be just a, an inch, or a cent two, three centimeters. If you see a cord coming down, you got problems. Put them in the knee chest position. Okay, high oxygen, hips elevated, um, knee chest, or head, head's got to be down. I, I wouldn't transport with me. Yeah, that's the best thing. If, you, if they won't tolerate it, put a 
three or four pillows or major cancer with butts really up in the air, but I would rather have them on the knee chest so they're not pressing on the vena cava. You still do your assessment, so if you come in you see a prolapse cord, you still got to ask the questions. It's a lot faster, transport's a lot faster, you got to get going faster, but you can still ask the same questions as you're moving her out of the, into the ambulance and put her in the knee chest and one guy's, uh, one of you is looking at the perineum and protecting the legs and stuff, and the other one's asking questions and writing them down. And is that something that you can see before the cervix is completely dilated? Oh yeah. So Once the cervix starts opening up two, three, four centimeters, that cord can come out. So you should look early? I had, you, look, you should look immediately. Okay. One of the first things you can do, I just got to make sure nothing's coming. Well, if, and while you're asking the questions or your partner or one of you, just, it only takes 10, 15 seconds. Uh, now, I'm sorry, we got to take your pants off or whatever dress, and we got to take a look and make sure nothing's coming out. Well, and nowadays, particularly with the ultrasounds, but even 30 years ago when I had my daughter, she was a breach, and we knew ahead of time. So the mother, if she's getting prenatal care, probably knows, wouldn't she, if, if there's a possibility of a breach? Uh, yeah, but that they're gonna, if they're a breach, they're going to know that because they had numerous ultrasounds, and the doctor generally is going to be following them. They stay breach and they stay breach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna, hopefully she will answer that question. Yeah. But I've seen babies turn breach to vertex the day before labor. Yeah. I've seen it go the other way around too, meaning it's vertex, ver it's butt, butt, butt. And I know you're breached, and I chance to know you're going to get a C-section if whatever. And she comes in labor, and dang, if it's not vertex. Mm -hmm. So babies, I'm humbled by pregnant women. I just uh, I'm humbled by pregnant ba women and babies. Um, so if you see the cord, meet back in there, and uh, they show a picture here, I think. Uh, again, I put them in the knee chest, but if you're not, they show what you need to do uh, is you don't want to push this cord back in because it won't go. You don't want to, you want to keep the baby's head or foot or whatever away from the cord. In the knee chest, it's easier than here. And I've never been able to do it with one finger because, uh, I shouldn't say never, but Generally, I have two fingers in the vagina, and I'm putting my fingers on the baby's head, generally, or butt, and pushing it up with the knee chest. It's a lot easier, and you want to keep the, the cord away from your fingers. So you push it up, and you push it away from the cord. So wherever, wherever the cord is laying, whether it's in the back of the vagina, the side, side, top, doesn't make any difference. You want to push that baby's presenting part away, and, and some of you may be stronger than others, but... I use two fingers and you transport with two fingers in the vagina all the way to the hospital. And then you let the nurse take over and she will jump and take your place over and put her fingers in the vagina and wheel you into the hospital. And it's happened at Sacred Heart. Uh, it actually labor and delivery and all of a sudden the cord prolapses. Same thing. The nurse will jump in there and she's got her fingers pushing the nurse, uh, the baby up there until we get in the C-section room and she's got, you can feel the cord pulsate. Uh, so you know it's still going. And she will stay in that position until anesthesia is there, pediatrician is there, everybody's ready to go. Then they'll flip you over, pull the fingers out, and bam, you're going. Uh, again, that's, you've got to keep the fingers in, and you push it to the right, to the left, up, down, whatever it is, so you can feel the cord pulsate against the back of your fingers or whichever way you're doing it. You want to feel that cord pulsate and keep it off the presenting part. And I use two fingers and tell the patient what you're doing and why. She's going to be frightened, and uh, if you have a moist towel, fine. It's not ideal. Put a cord around it, but because uh, uh, if you have a long transport, that's probably important. But hopefully, you're not talking that long. But the key is, I think, push the baby's head or presenting part away from the cord. Uh, don't try and pull the cord. Don't try and push it back in. Okay, that's a foot lean breach. Coming down, you can see how much room there is between the perineum so that cord can come down. Same with the uh, arm presentation and a transverse lie. Uh, this is what they, technically a breach. The butt's coming down first with a leg coming out. But it can be compound, and I've seen that too with a foot and an arm coming down here. So you got a foot here and an arm here and a cord right in the middle. So uh, the same thing, put your fingers in the vagina and push it away from the uh, best you can. Emergency care uh, is oxygen, transport, start an IV if you have the time. Uh, and I put them in the knee chest, the same, the same reason for the prolapse cord. The knee chest allows gravity to keep the baby's head out of the uh, butt or leg out of the pelvis. Uh, 
multiple births, uh, that's essentially the, the same for each delivery. So if twin A comes out, she's got twins, don't try and do anything, but twin B can come out too, but it, it may stay up in there. And on preterm labor and delivery, lots of times, uh, lots of depends situation, but we'll deliver twin A, and we'll try and get it at 32 weeks, because it comes. We'll try and keep the baby, twin B, in there as long as we can with continuous monitoring. That's more than you need to know. But having said that, uh, twin B, if it comes, it's the same type thing. So if she pushes twin A out, be ready for twin B, transport, and twin B comes. So if you have, should have a couple of those kits in the ambulance, so you need two, um, two separate kits if you do happen to have twins. Um, again, call for assistance. They'll tell your paramedic where you're going to meet them. You're coming up this way and, and meet wherever so he can jump on board and be an extra set of hand for you. Uh, but you don't want to wait at home unless you think the intimate's delivery's intimate. But you, what you can do, again, is call the hospital and say, this is what I got going on. Should we start transport or should I wait for the paramedic to get here? He, he or she is. Uh, it's a decision you don't have to make by yourself. Uh, share the burden, if you will. Uh, premature birth, uh, hypothermia. Depending on gestational age, 36, 37 weeks, they're probably okay. Earlier they are, the more likely they are to need resuscitation. Um, that's not always true, but it's still more likely you're going to have that. So before 37 weeks, again, make sure everybody knows about what's going on and be prepared to resuscitate if you need be. Uh, meconium staining, we've talked about that. Uh, it's suggested, doesn't mean anything. Uh, it just suggests. Uh, that there may be a problem and you've got to make sure the main thing you worry about meconium is uh, suction the baby out so it doesn't get amniotic fluid in the lungs. Okay, meconium, don't stimulate for suction. This goes back to we talked about I like to suction on the perineum before the baby's shoulder comes out because once the shoulders come out the lungs expand and what they're going to do they're going to suck in that stuff that's in the mouth. So uh, I really like to suck on the perineum uh, uh, beforehand but if uh, the big fear is the shoulder dystocia, which we talked about. Airway, ventilate as need be. I would start oxygen, transport as quick as possible, and meet your paramedic along the way or whatever your protocol is to uh, do that so that you're all together as a team. You can never have enough hands when you're doing a delivery. Uh, the more hands you have helping you out, the better. Okay, questions on any of that? What time is it? Are we doing okay? I've been talking for an hour and a half? Yeah. 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 You want to take a break or want to just finish this out real quick? Just finish, finish it, okay. I didn't think I was that long winded. Woo. Uh, uh, I'm sorry for keeping you so late. I'll go a tad bit faster. But I'm willing to stick around if you have questions, uh, personal questions, or you want to just pass something by me, feel free to do so. Uh, it can be GYN also, it doesn't have to be just OB related. I did, oh, I did GYN for 35 years, OB for 38. Okay, back, back space. Okay, we sort of talked a lot about this stuff anyway. Uh, Profilus bulini from the vagina, a percent of previa. That means the previa is coming first. It can be a partial previa, a complete previa. Generally, if it's the nurse or the patient should know that. In theory, that's correct. They don't always will tell you. Because uh, the doctor is going to be doing lots of ultrasounds if it's a partial or of real low line placenta, they're going to be doing lots of ultrasounds, but in the anxiety and stuff, she may not mention that to you. Uh, so heavy vaginal bright red bleeding uh, is usually the placenta is um, a previa or an abruption, which we went to. Um, painless vaginal bleeding, she's not having any pain, but it's like a faucet turned out in the vagina. That's probably a previa, and the placenta is starting to separate uh, a little bit, but it doesn't necessarily have to uh, have pain associated with it. And if there's heavy, heavy vaginal bleeding, you may have shock. There's nothing you can do about it. Start an IV, oxygen, and transport. Let the hospital know what's going on. Meet your paramedic or whatever what works out and do the best you can. Go from there. And I'm going to go a little bit fast. So if you have a question on this, because I think this is, uh, again, I think, uh, I can't say this enough time, share the burden. And when I did high-risk OB that last three years, uh, all the obstetrician of Sacred Heart and a deaconess, Deb, Owen, if you remember Dr. Owen here, she's down at Deke doing a hospice program uh, at Deaconess. But they're all board certified. They all can handle it. But it's sure reassuring when, uh, for the attending guy to have us on the floor sleeping there to watch the fetal monitor, 
to share the burden of should I do a foreship, should I do a C-section, what do you think of this tracing? And it's just to make sure your life and your heart last a lot longer, so don't hesitate to call. Uh, shock, again, with bleeding, if they are on scene or in the ambulance, this can happen when you, they're not doing anything at home, they're not doing anything when you load them in the ambulance, then they cut loose in the ambulance. So that's why you've always got to look every few minutes or whatever you're comfortable with, take a look what's going on because she can start bleeding at any time and you want to, don't want to just be covered over with a sheet and all of a sudden, oh my God, when she's got a couple liters in the bed. So take a look at it. Uh, external pads, you're not going to stop the bleeding, that's just for, so you don't have to clean up the bus as much. <laughs> it's just, uh, anybody know where the, an the term bus came from? I don't know, I call it an ambulance, but people around here call it buses sometimes. Huh? Oh, whatever. Um, okay. Yeah, I know. Okay, uh, external pads are just for uh, less mess. It's not going to stop anything uh, at all. Transport. And I would start, they don't mention IV or oxygen, but if you have the time. I wouldn't waste 20 minutes trying to start an IV. If you can't start it, put them on oxygen and transport. Um, if you have the time, fine. Sometimes IVs are easy to start, sometimes they're difficult to start. But I certainly would, I'd rather have the patient at the hospital five minutes earlier than five minutes with an IV. So it depends on a judgment call. And you can add, again, you can call the hospital, hey, she's bleeding heavily, should I start an IV or should you want me to transport? Chances are good they're going to say transport. But I'll, you can share that too. Um, let's just see here, I'll go back one. Uh, <laughs> abdominal pain means what they call an abruption. This may, there may be a slide on this, but I'll go over it now. Abruptio placenta or abruption is when the placenta separates. A previa means it's low line and covering the cervix. And as the cervix dilates up and opens up, it goes from closed, uh, less than one centimeter, to ten centimeters. If there's portion of the placenta that is now exposed to the vagina, that's a previa. And all those sinuses are going to open up and she's going to bleed, but it's going to be painless. If there's really intense pain, this goes back to putting your hand on the abdomen, if the uterus is t tight and painful and there's no relief between contractions, that tells you the placenta is starting to separate, called abruptio placenta. Again, uh, there's not much, there's nothing you can do about it except I suspect a partial, it can be a 10%, 50%, 100% abruption. Uh, you're not going to know that either. Key is oxygen, transport, blood pressure monitoring, start an IV if need be. Um, and that one last year was a full separation. Mm -hmm. When we got there, she was head down on her knees, and you see the big old blood clot. Yeah. It was just a race. Called the hospital. They had a surgeon waiting on us by the time they got there. That's the exact key to call ahead of time. Because as you know, they don't always have everybody sitting right there. So if you've got meconium, you've got uh, decreased heart phones, you've got uh, bruptio or heavy bleeding, they're calling people in. So when you hit the door, they've got anesthesia, they've got the pediatrician, they've got the obstetrician or whoever, and uh, ready to go. So that's a good point, thank you. And that helps. So when they're in there, they're going to take it right to the section room. Right, but you can see what would happen if you don't call ahead of time, because then they got to call everybody in. So, but pain for an abruption <coughs> is not labor pains that come and go, come and go. I'm talking about continuous pain, and the worse the abruption, the worse the pain. Okay, whoop. Okay, Can we talk about bleeding there. Uh, ectopic pregnancy is usually in the first 14, 16 weeks, uh, usually 8 to 12 or 8 to 14 is what they call it. That means a pregnancy is in the fallopian tube or the abdomen, it's not in the uterus. Uh, it's not uh, a miscarriage technically, it's what they call it. You're not going to have that diagnosis, you can be suspected, but it's a diagnosis by ultrasound and laparoscopy, etc. But uh, real bad right or left lower quadrant pain. They may have bleeding, they may not have any bleeding, they may have bleeding uh, internally, and you get what they call uh, rebound tenderness. And when you put your hand on the uterus, you just sort of push in with your fingers in all four quadrants. The earlier the ectopic, you're going to have pain in the lower quadrants. 
The more blood that's in there, you're going to have irritation of the blood of the perineum. You're going to have all four quadrants pain. And so if you've got all four quadrants involved, she could have lots of blood in there, shock, IV, oxygen. That's the sign you're going to have. They, the most common, I could be wrong, I haven't looked in the last couple of years, but the most common maternal death is ectopic, ruptured ectopic pregnancy at home. They don't know it. They just bleed out inside and so not externally, it's all internally. So that's still a problem even today, is ectopic pregnancy. Rapid uh, weak pulse, hypotension. Uh, the, the longer the ectopic's been there, your husband walks in the door and his wife's unconscious on the floor, and she's 12 weeks pregnant. She may not even know she's pregnant. So you just got to assume ectopic until proven otherwise and go from there. Uh, but that's, an, again, an obstetrical emergency or gynecologic emergency. And you call ahead of time, I think we may have an ectopic. And pulse is this, respirations are that, and she's losing consciousness or whatever. Again, that gives the hospital heads up to get anesthesia and everybody there. Uh, rapid transport, oxygen, so shock, treat for shock. And again, whether you start an IV, depends on your skill level, comfort level, how far you got to go. Again, if it's a long way, you can ask, but, uh, uh, and so I would rather have you at the hospital 10 minutes earlier than 10, 15 minutes trying to start an IV and get it all ready and stuff like that. But again, you can share that burden with your paramedic and the uh, hospital. Seizures, uh, that's what they call toxemia, which is what they worry about with my daughter. She didn't have it, but that can turn, the, turn in five minutes. Uh, toxemia or preeclampsia is hypertension in the, in the mother, proteinuria, uh, pedoedema. The end result is seizures. Uh, again, if someone calls them and says they've had a seizure, whether it's a petit mal type thing or a grand mal seizure, generally they're grand mal. Uh, again, it's oxygen, transfer on the left side. You don't want flashing lights and you want to keep it dark. You want the uh, ambulance uh, warmed up. And you don't want a siren going unless you actually have to because there's no question. Flashing lights uh, and loud noises stimulate a seizure. Again, you can share that burden with your paramedic or with the uh, hospital. Can I, uh, should I put, I understand the difficulty, uh, but let them help you make that call. Uh, if you need the lights and you need the siren, go for it. But if you don't, it's just a judgment call on your part, but uh, flashing lights especially can cause repeat seizures, so just beware of that. Warmth, prepare the hospital again. Pre there's nothing you're going to do if she's got toxemia. Uh, she's going to have seizures. She may be in labor, but probably not. And you can transport, and the hospitals have a heads up that this woman's having seizures with her. And she may have epilepsy, so you can ask if you have any history of epilepsy. But she's got toxemia. And you can have epilepsy and preeclampsia, or toxemia. So you treat as, that's the worst case scenario, so you treat as toxemia and uh, go from there. Um, gently, no uh, flashing lights, do the best you can. But you got to do what you got to do as first responders, get them to the hospital safely and quick as you can. If that involves siren and lights, I'd put a towel over her eyes or whatever so she doesn't see the flashing LED, red lights if need be. So just something to keep back in your mind. Um, miscarriage. First 12 weeks, you really don't know whether it's a miscarriage or an ectopic. Treatment's the same. Treat for shock. Uh, you don't want to pack, uh, whether she's bleeding heavy, you don't want to pack the vagina with pads or anything. Oxygen, uh, if there's any tissue, you've got bags in your OB kit of any tissue at all. And sometimes it's difficult. You, she can be passing clots. It looks like tissue, but you won't know that until the pathologist dissects it out and looks. And there can be tissue within the blood clot, so anything she passes, and then emotional caring support. Um, there's one other thing we didn't cover is stillborns, um, which happen. How many have been on a stillborn case, Ron? A couple of you? That's the most, I mean, that's just difficult. Uh, and I think you, you, if she delivers at home, or she has a stillborn, or she has sudden infant death syndrome, uh, I would just assume the baby's alive until proven otherwise. So you resuscitate, you do, you do your cardiopulmonary resuscitation, you tell call ahead of time. Now you may suspect the baby's dead, uh, and it might be, even if it's all dark, been dead for a while. Don't assume anything. You fully transport and keep going with resuscitation all the way and, and have your partner document stuff and keep them informed. Tell them what's going on. If they ride the ambulance with you, which they might, I probably will. Uh, 
you don't want to do nothing, even though it may be hopeless. So you just assume we're concerned, we're worried, uh, but uh, you transport all the way. You give as much emotional support and reassurance to the mother, who's going to be hysterical, or the, the parents, or grandmother, or whoever, and, uh, uh, and just be supportive. You're not going to be there for the long-term counseling, but as long as you're supportive, as long as you're doing everything possible that you can do, even though the baby's obviously dead, it makes no difference. Uh, in my opinion. So go for it and go from there. Anybody that's been on a stillborn case or a fetal demise or sudden infant death syndrome, any questions or comments you want to make on that or add anything or take anything? I think one thing that's got to be a little bit aware of is the fact that the first responders is uh, we get there and we have early dead baby potentially cramps. And you have what? We have a really dead baby. You know, we have a baby that's been down for quite some time. Um, it's potentially cramping. So we have a dead person there now. Um, yeah. That's baby. So it's, uh, at least if nothing else, it's something probably not a terrible idea. To just remember what the scene looked like. If you're going to grab the baby and go and try to give as detailed a description of the scene, because um, you will probably be more likely to talk about mom Yeah. Don't be surprised if you feel like if you haven't been on one of those. Uh, don't be surprised if you kind of feel like a criminal when that because the cops will ask you a lot of questions, and it can sometimes get to the point where you're just like, I don't know. I think it's an excellent point, and and uh, because we've all uh, I've seen babies get their head slammed against the wall and the and hit slapped around, and so you never know. Um, Again, it goes if it's obviously been dead a day or six, eight hours, and it's got a rigor mortis, then fine. Then you probably should wait for your paramedic and and uh, you discuss among yourselves what you would do. But the police are going to get involved for sure. And everybody's going to have to make sure that it wasn't it truly is a sudden infant death and not uh, some abuse from somewhere. Uh, it's sad that we have to think that, but unfortunately, we've all seen it, especially work in the emergency room. So uh, the cops will be asking lots of questions, and all you have to do is say. This is the call. We got on scene. This is what we did. This is why we made the diagnosis. It was blue, not breathing, not move, and Riga Morgus. Obviously been dead for a number of hours. Uh, but if there's any doubt in your mind, I'd resuscitate until the paramedic gets there or until someone makes that call. You err on the side of over treatment than under treatment. But it's still tough when you know it's probably not going to make it. Okay, that's the end of the OB. I'll go into the GYN stuff real quick, so you can get on your way. Questions? Comments? Okay. Trauma? Same type thing. That, that's, uh, uh, I've seen it here in Tampa when I was riding the uh, fire engine, uh, fights between spouses where the husband kicks or swats the woman. Uh, the mother-in-law kicked the woman in one, in one case. and uh, So you've seen it. Again, there's really no other... You can cause an abruption if she gets hit or kicked in the abdomen. You can cause a placental separation, uh, which we've seen. Cocaine and drugs. Cocaine and methamphetamine can cause an abruption. Uh, so ask about drug use if you're suspicious. And, and, uh, and you really, be con I've been surprised. These are the nicest looking couple, whether it's a three-piece suit, man, <laughs> oh, got cocaine. Or, Wife's on methamphetamine, she looks like the million dollars. So you never know, but you have to be uh, suspicious of drug abuse and just ask. Um, trauma, yeah, I think the fetal death is maternal death. So due to trauma, and I've got lots of stories I'm not going to bore you with, but that happens. Uh, external genitalia. Uh, I would, uh, this is really not all that, I mean, I, I don't know what common means, but uh, def, how you define common, but it's not uncommon to see uh, a woman on a bicycle or uh, riding a bike or falling skiing and hit a ski pole or uh, uh, falling and getting out of cars uh, uh, or aggressive sex. I'm not sure if that's the right term, uh, but the vagina gets real soft in pregnancy, so the closer you are to term, the last trimester, uh, normal sex, which whatever they're used to doing, just because they hit it wrong, the vagina can tear a little bit and bleed pretty heavily. I've seen them fall in wheel, uh, those window wells, 
they're doing gardening, and she falls, and she misses and jumps and falls on a wood. So it does happen. Again, there's not really not much. Just be aware of it happens. There are accidents generally, and uh, you don't want to pack the vagina. Just transport uh, ongoing assessment for any trauma or any. They're usually not going to bleed. They're going to bleed. Uh, don't get me wrong, because the vagina is very vascular. And that's why it heals so well. Uh, they can bleed pretty heavily, but all you do is put pressure on there with a peri pad and transport. But it does occur. So you want to ask, is there any trauma or intercourse uh, or something like that? Uh, I might go back to drug abuse because I'm not sure I mentioned it, but a drug abuse will cause a, a separation of placenta. Cocaine, methamphetamine are famous for it. And we've had patients at Sacred Heart who are on both drugs and sent to us because the private guys didn't want to take care of the drug addicts. But we've had, it just blows me away that they're pregnant and their buddies will come in and give them the drug, cocaine or methamphetamine, while they're in the hospital and we're trying to get them stopped. And they will hide it underneath the bed. This is not an issue, but they will hide the cocaine or methamphetamine under a blanket or under a, a, a chair. And it's just amazing. The nurses have to be within those ladies, with those ladies 24-7 when they have visitors because they will try and slip it to them. That's just the side point. <coughs> sexual assault, it doesn't always have to be sexual assault. It can be just sex that, uh, if it is assault, that's a whole different ball game. In pregnancy, I guess this is GYN, but you can have a pregnancy too, but the, uh, for sexual assault, if you're called on those cases, again, it's just respect their privacy, uh, be caring, be respectful, collect all the clothes that they were wearing at the time or took off and changed. Um, if they took a shower before you get there, try and get their clothes so you take it to the, uh, most hospitals now uh, have a rape or sexual assault group that get together and take care of them when you get there. Uh, privacy from bystanders. Uh, just you don't have to do an, uh, just do the regular exam you do, but you don't have to do a public exam or anything. In fact, the farther you stay away from that, the better, unless you have to. Uh, just sort of transport them and, and, and get their clothes and get a history. And the uh, sexual assault group will take a much more detailed history and importance. The key is transport quickly and respectfully and uh, be sympathetic. It's just an ugly situation. Um, like that. Uh, okay, preserve. Sometimes uh, I've seen it where they take, they feel so bad, they want to take a quick shower as fast as they can. If they do, collect the towel, collect the clothes, underwear, whatever they've got, and put it in a bag it up and take it with you. Uh, don't let them bathe. Uh, and this is where someone mentioned earlier, observe what did you see around the house? Or what did you see in the bed? Well, just put your observations. Uh, and write them down if you can, because you're probably going to forget within a week or two weeks or three weeks. So as a team, the two of you can what you saw or how the husband, the spouse acted or how the guy acted or how the patient acted. It's just a perception, um, but if you document it, then you can refer back to it months later when and if it ever comes to pass. Um, These are just review questions. I'm not going to test you on this. Quiz, I'm not going to have quiz without grades, but uh, well, thank you for putting up here for two hours. I appreciate it. I didn't know I talked that long. Sorry to keep you waiting, but uh, any questions or comments or thoughts or from your own personal experiences uh, as a mother or a father or a EMT, first responder, you want to share with us or want me to emphasize more? I'm just making my life easy today. <laughs> no questions. So uh, I'll stick around here. If anybody has questions, wants to come up and just ask me because for whatever. And I'm free to discuss hormones and menopause. Got no problem with that. I'm really a hit at the parties. I go sit in the corner with the women, let all these guys talk about sports and lie on the other side because I know what they're doing. I just soon talk about hormones, relationships, and, <laughs> and, and uh, <laughs> parenting. Okay. Thank you. All men have a sensitive side. They have an X chromosome and a Y. So you ladies, hey, I want, you know, I want to see your X chromosome show, and I don't want this Y stuff anymore. <laughs>